years when like you ratted your hair all up. And uh, she had the Mondo Ladies Club. So there was a, a raid at the bakery one day right there, the El Rio, the, the, the Migra King. And, uh, and Conch Curly got all the viejitas out of the church. And they surrounded all the Border Patrol vans. They couldn't drive them away. And uh, like that was the spirit of Mondo. And then these two kids came, uh, Isabel Garcia and Margarita Bernal. And they're like in, in law school. <laughs> Like we're just, we're all just like rocking the world, having fun, and these these, these sisters come and like they're going to be boys. So they want to volunteer. Well, of course, we put we put them now. Look what happened. To them. <laughs> um, <laughs> it was a it was a really really special moment. I think it was a. Then this historian came too. It it was a special moment in history, and it was a really special moment that brought together just all sorts of people with all sorts of gifts that, um, you know, came together. I mean, Ricardo, uh, Raquel, uh, all came and had a great deal of patience with us. Um, I can't imagine how, why, <laughs> how you did that. Um, I used to have the greatest fight with John. They were, they, they were great, you know. Um, it, was, it was a spot where magic was made. from the Chicano movement, which had been centered there in the West Side out of the Chicano liberation committee from the 60s and 70s and all the brown parade. So the whole center of Manzo uh, was really the core were these women who had come out of that uh, political experience and um, that continued building, so uh, Tim Nunn, who was one of the uh, also activists in here, saw his, his mother being beaten by the police there, and he jumped in, several people got arrested, I remember Ken Cannon trying to stop a police car, uh, so it, there was, out of Manzo, you might say, the pre-sanctuary pre uh, conditions were established that served as sanctuary. to Manzo was that we had uh, hundreds of people that were bonded out. Eventually, those of us who were on the board of Manzo uh, were taken to federal court and charged because we were refusing to turn over the bond information to the feds. And uh, we were represented by an attorney in town, and uh, we said to us that day is you think you all are getting away with this and in front of that was uh, myself, Margo Isabel, uh, Ramona Vijalba who was on our board and, and several other of the women and he said to us you think you're getting away with this but you're not getting away from it because on judgment day God will punish all of you. <laughs> Uh, it, and, and he was the same judge that the indicted uh, uh, sanctuary people went before. I was just curious about um, maybe even just taking the part, the first part in terms of this this play we just saw. What kind of lessons did you learn 
oh, what kind of lessons did you learn? You know, like either quite quickly as this thing was going through, either strategy. The question was, what kind of lessons did you learn as you were thrust into this, uh, into this work? Uh, well, I think the most important thing that, that we learned uh, out of the whole experience of sanctuary was a, a brand new concept. Called, we called it civil initiative to distinguish it from civil disobedience. I mean, you you heard what we all thought. Margot said, of course, and and all of us thought we were doing civil disobedience in the classic sense of Dr. King and Gandhi and all sorts of other folks. Uh, and and in fact, when we did the service. Uh, to welcome the family from El Salvador into the sanctuary of Southside Church, uh, I quoted King and Gandhi and the Bible and uh, every, everything I could think of to, to, to establish the principle of civil disobedience under these circumstances. And then about a month later, I get a call in my office, and this guy says, my name's Ira Gullivan. I'm a human rights attorney from New York, and you've got to stop talking about civil disobedience. You're not doing civil disobedience. And I said, yeah, right. <laughs> I'm just waiting for the indictments to come down because they told us that's what's going to happen. Uh, and he said, and this is a direct quote, listen, dummy. <laughs> he said, civil disobedience classically is violating a bad law, be willing to take the consequences of that violation on yourself in order to change that bad law. And I said, yeah, <laughs> I got it. And he said, but we don't want to change the law. We worked hard to get refugee, international standards on refugees adopted into United States law. And he said, so, Every time you talk about civil disobedience, people get the issue all mixed up. The issue is, it's the federal government that's violating United States law. They're the ones who are doing civil disobedience by continuing to deport refugees back to El Salvador and Guatemala. So he said, stop talking about civil disobedience. And I said, well, I think I understand, but what do we call it then? And he said, I don't know, make it up. <laughs> and so, of course, I went to Corbett, right, and told him about the phone call, and Jim took it from there. Uh, and he developed the whole concept of civil initiative to distinguish it from civil disobedience, and, and that was the ground we walked on for the rest of the sanctuary movement. Would anyone else like to chime in on that? I just want to say that, you know, we all came, as you can see, Pat, Jim, all of us, Father Ricardo, uh, is a one here. We, we all came from um, very different tracks, but what we shared, um, we shared an understanding and a passion that knew no limits. I, I tried to maintain that I know no limits. And so when we're faced with um, the kinds of horrific situations that we heard day in and day out, we, just like Jim, so we have to do this. We have to do that, you know. And, and this one kept worrying about the money on the bonds. Somebody put up their living room. How are they going to take the living room? I, th 
feel really blessed because I learned how to organize and manipulate. But there's no limits. The only limits are mine. And, and, and you can't ever stop with those limits, you know? And, and that was the magic that all of us brought. And then refugees started coming and joining us. And, um, you know, these, are, these were people that just have been, it was just a horrific thing. But, but it passed. And then they began to contribute to the magic, and it took on other dimensions. And I think you have a sense of what I'm describing is so powerful. It can't be controlled, and it can't be stopped. And, you know, this moment that we're living today is very much like that moment. The stories that we hear today that come to our clinics uh, and tell us about what happens in Mexico and Central America ring so much like the other stories. And I, when, you know, you were talking to to Victor and uh, people were going through what they had experienced. We we represented everybody, and that was really a controversial um, thing to do in those days because we weren't just leftists. Like we we bonded out people who were in the death squad. We I represented the national chess champion of El Salvador. I mean, just everybody, 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 because we we understood that we didn't live their life experience, that, that we could never comprehend it. You know, and these kind of things that I'm saying, I think it's really important for us today when there's so much noise and ugliness to try and find those values again. And in the work that we do, we interact, to try and be clear about how we apply those same values today because they're, they're so parallel. Part of this, I don't recall that there was much written out, but was that charge you led out to El Corralón, 115 degrees in El Centro. And that gang that you put in the motel. Yeah. Okay, okay, so he... Father Ricardo's wanting me to tell stories. I won't tell too many, but I will tell one little story. Is so in the, in those days there were five detention facilities in the whole United States. It's hard to believe five, okay? And so the one that took care of our area was in El Centro, California, and they had uh, huge I don't know 25 foot chain link fences. They had cots outside. In the summertime, it would get to be, your feet would stick in the asphalt. It was just horrific. So when, when John was doing his best work raising bond money, we'd bond out like 75 or 100 people at a time. And so then we'd throw a picket line around the facility with the same guys that just bonded out. Yeah. And that's how, that's how we kept everybody's animo up, everybody's spirits up, because we said, we're coming for you. This week, we got these guys. Keep raising it, keep raising it. And next week, we're coming for you. And what was really, really beautiful was that we took those people to a Catholic church, a black Catholic church in Watts. And their families came and met them there and reunited with them there and then went off across America. So, so in all the little pieces of our mosaic that are so powerful contributed to, to that magic. So these nuns, I will tell you one little story because this, this one's too good to pass up. So they didn't, you know, they didn't have internet and they, they, you couldn't communicate and all that, INS in those days. And so we, we kept bonding out people all over the place, and they would have call-ups. So they'd say, you have to be in the Manhattan Federal Courthouse in two weeks from when you were out of, out of El Centro. So there's this church in, in Brooklyn called the Church of the Transfiguration, this Catholic church. And, um, and in those days, the nuns did their whole thing. They had their, whole, their uniforms, right? And so I told them, you got to find these 18 boys because I'm coming. See, one thing we did is I held all the notices of appearance 
for everybody who was in detention so they couldn't have multiple hearings so i could control the calendar and that kind of backfired after a while because when they got bonded out then there'd be hearings in states all over the place where the run around for well so i told these nuns gather up these guys and i'll fly in and we'll go down and we'll present them and then i'm going to have to go somewhere else they couldn't find them so they brought eighteen other guys <laughs> And you know, these, these, these women are like, you're not gonna say that they're running a game. I mean, you know, you're just not gonna say it. And, and they didn't have fingerprints, they didn't have photographs, they didn't have the internet, didn't have anything, file by file. Jose so-and-so, presente. You know, Juan so-and-so, presente. You know? And these nuns are just real serious. And real, you know? So we, we did stuff like that, you know, and it, and it worked. And then came the amnesty of 1986, and everybody legalized, and it was, it was a gift. And uh, you know this guy, we have a clinic at Pueblo High School, in case anybody wants to volunteer. <laughs> Thursday nights at 5.30, keep Tucson together. And, and so this guy comes in and he says, no te recuerdas de mi? You know, you don't remember me? Well, I'm, no. <laughs> he said, you got me out of El Centro, and guess what? What? My daughter's a lawyer and she works for the Florence Project. Yeah. Yeah. And over the years, we've heard all sorts of stuff like that that comes back. And, and I just share that because when we do this kind of stuff, we, we really don't know what we do. You know, maybe we get somebody out of detention, maybe we get some green card, but we really, really don't know what we do. And, and I know everybody in this room does stuff, but the stuff that we do is incredibly powerful. Yeah. There were, you know, sanctuary, sanctuary and the activities that occurred around this spread across the country. Like as we traveled up to meet some of the people that needed to appear, we would tra travel all the way
every heart was a sanctuary. I, I have a question for you. I just wanted to, to uh, mention something about these first person stories that are being told here, especially for Hal Round, this listening in about theater. She was talking about how this became a community, how this idea turned into community. And a theater like this play, Sanctuary, which is part of the sequence to tell this story, is building community again in this generation at this time. And that's one of the wonderful things that can happen when a playwright like Milta goes and finds you all and your stories and first person accounts and turns them into a play that can reach and create more community, like you're talking about. These first person stories are absolutely essential. This kind of 21st century documentary storytelling is essential for all of us now. I did want to ask John Fife one question about this play ends when the church, this this first play in the sequence, ends when the church decides to declare sanctuary. And there's a little discussion in the play about how we're going to get this word out. And I wonder if you could give us a little history of your interactions with the media, your interactions with newspapers or TV or things. How fast did that happen and, and uh, how, how difficult was it to manage that? think you can manage that uh, but but a couple of significant things did happen uh, one was I had this he's been alluded to earlier I had this seminary intern who was on my staff who was supposed to assist me in the ministry of the church right and, and so we had to sit down and write a job description for the seminary about what he was supposed to accomplish while he was here for that year. And, and at the end, I said to him, Tim, uh, this, his name's Tim Knott. And, and I, I just happened off the top of my head say, Tim, one thing that you might just add to that job description, if you have any time, we have been doing all of this crazy stuff and making it up as we go along and we've never had a time to sit down and really think about <laughs> what it is we're doing and why we're doing it and what we need to do in the future we would I mean, I mean, it was just lurching from crisis to crisis and trying to manage chaos as best we could uh, and and so tim said oh, okay and and he came to me about three months later, and he said, well, I've been working on that thinking about it thing, and, and I've arranged a whole gathering of theologians and historians and folks from El Salvador and folks from Guatemala, and uh, by the way, Elie Wiesel is going to do the keynote speech. <laughs> uh, and, and he was responsible for uh, almost all of the relationships with media and that sort of thing. And the key to it was he did a great job at the Declaration of Sanctuary. I mean, we had national media there, which none of us ever expected. And it was due to Tim's hard work uh, and lying a little bit. <laughs> but that's part of the deal. Uh, he was he was exaggerating the, uh, the whole thing. Yeah, yeah it, was, it was like the nuns in Brooklyn. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, but but I think the key thing was about two or three weeks after we had done the Declaration of Sanctuary, I get a call in my office from 60 Minutes who say to us, uh, we, are, we think it's an interesting story about priests and nuns smuggling refugees across the border out there in the wilds of Arizona. And so we'd like to come out and film a border crossing. Can we do that? Uh, and, 
And so we all sat down and, and I mean, it was, it was a long conversation because, I mean, how do you, how do you take the care for a refugee family for that additional risk of taking 60 minutes television crew with you on a crossing? Uh, and, and how do you ensure that they're doing that of their own volition and not to somehow be coerced into something by us? Uh, North Americans are always doing that. <laughs> uh, and, and so what happened was we did the crossing down in Douglas. <laughs> the, then there wasn't a wall. There was just a, a raggedy old fence. And the cemetery in Douglas was right next to the fence. And so we'd dress up people as mourners with flowers and cross them through the, pop them through. And they'd spend some time in the cemetery and then walk over and get in the vehicle and go to Tucson. Uh, and, and 60 Minutes filmed it. Uh, and when they showed a couple of episodes of Jim and Pat which were very powerful. Uh, uh, then a movement started. And we had never imagined that we were doing anything but self-defense before we got indicted. That was everything <laughs> up to that moment. And then when 60 Minutes really did those couple of episodes of Jim and Pat and the crossing, uh, I get calls from all over the country. What's this sanctuary idea, and how do we do it, and, and how can we do it, and can you send us refugees? And that's where the whole rest of it ends. I've got a question for Pat. Okay. Sanctuary really started when Corbett came to me and said, my wife says she's going to divorce me if we don't get 17 refugees out of our trailer. And and, and can we bring them to the church and keep them there? Uh, and that was really the beginning of Sanctuary. And, and I don't know, Pat, was that a true story or was Jim just... Well, it was 20-some, as I recall. <laughs> and the other thing, no, I didn't threaten to divorce him, but I did threaten other, other things, which I won't mention here. But I just thought, well, there's all these churches around, and they have all this room. They have a heck of a lot more room than I do. <laughs> and, you know, I, I, people would ask me what I did in sanctuary, and I would usually tell them I was the plumber because, you know, like I'm fixing the plumbing because this place wasn't designed for 20-some people. Uh, and I was really getting tired of being the plumber. <laughs> we got to say some more. What it was like at their house with the, 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 uh, all the refugees there on the old roof and the, <laughs> the interpersonal, whatever. Well, the, the other problem was they would bring all these folks from El Centro, and they'd bring whatever flu or terrible case of bronchitis or whatever was going around El Centro when they came, and then I would catch it. And I would also convince me that the churches could have their share of, of flu and uh, They kept asking, bring, as I say, bring more flour and oil, <laughs> on and on. And While somebody comes up, I do have a question. There's a microphone right here by where Mark is. If somebody has a question, please come up. Please. Uh, great. Let me just quickly ask the main folk. Did you have more federal government to the hierarchy of your denomination? <laughs> Uh, I belong to a religious order, and they kind of leave us alone. At that time, our order had a western province. Uh, among the men's Catholic religious orders, 
There were the Mary Knowles in New York, headquartered in New York in our Oakland province that publicly said we do sanctuary. The problem with the hierarchy with the bishops is that two bishops at that time, uh, national names, one of them was also still a licensed civil lawyer, and they sent out this letter all over. Don't get into this. The ones that did across the country beautifully were the nuns. Steve, that's a, that's a really important question because I was fortunate to – I had just finished up eight years on the National Policy Council of the Presbyterian Church. So I had personal relationships with the leadership of the denomination. So when we started this – well, even before we started this – Margot would come to the office, as you could see, and say, I need $30,000 more for the action in El Centro, or we need to, yeah, tomorrow, or <laughs> it's on my credit card, it was yesterday, or whatever it was. Uh, and so I was able to, to just make those contacts easily uh, because of those personal relationships. And then the denomination, uh, uh, was great in terms of support. Uh, many of our volunteers later on after in the next version, yes. uh, <laughs> the next iteration. Uh, the the head who the guy who was the head of the office of young adult volunteers for the Presbyterian Church, I mean, literally gave me a blank check. He said, "You tell me how many young adults you need to come volunteer on the border." and we'll make it happen. And there was a whole community of folks that grew out of that blank check. So, so I was very lucky, but uh, most other denominations struggled <laughs> with the idea of sanctuary uh, for some time. Uh, but eventually, uh, there was pretty broad unanimity uh, among all of the denominations, if it, if it wasn't sanctioned by the bishops, there were convents and monasteries and churches and parishes and bishops and archbishops that said, to hell with the national conference, we need to do this. Uh, and so the, it, it really was a grassroots rising and movement that, that eventually the denominations and the hierarchies had to go, had to recognize, I guess. I have a question about, um, because it sounds like when you, and just from what you've shared with me when I interviewed you all, um, that churches, be, there was a network of churches built throughout the country that were, um, that were doing this kind of work. And can you talk about how that network has moved through the years and if it's still happening right now and how that functions? Well, it, as you all know, this idea of sanctuary uh, is, is currently um, a much broader and a much deeper movement than we ever envisioned or experienced in the 1980s. Uh, the big difference now is that it's primarily a secular movement by cities and states and counties uh, and colleges and universities uh, to protect the community uh, of that whatever that secular institution is. But there are also thousands of churches and synagogues and mosques that have declared that they will be a sanctuary. Uh, in the 1980s, the leadership was by faith communities uh, uh, that, were, that were declaring sanctuary and formed the network that was faith-based, and cities and the state of New Mexico as secular institutions uh, did so in support of those faith communities. But the leadership was clearly from the refugees and the, and the faith communities that were a part of 
of the sanctuary movement in the 80s. Now it's the opposite side of the, that coin. Uh, it's cities and states and colleges and universities that are primarily the, the leadership in, in the sanctuary movement now. And I keep telling them, them secular humanists that they stole our idea. <laughs> uh, but it's fine. We're delighted they stole it. But, but as you know, Sessions is already in the Justice Department attacking those secular institutions. And colleges and universities are every bit as vulnerable as cities and counties and states. Uh, so we'll have to, so far the courts have upheld their right to do that. But if that fails in the courts, then faith communities are going to be the strategy of next resort. <laughs> and we're going to have to be there and we're going to have to step up in ways we never imagined in the 80s. Uh, so it's a, it's a different context uh, that, we're, that we're dealing with now, but it's a much broader and much deeper movement uh, than, than we ever envisioned in the 1980s. Let me just add something to what John said, and it's, there's a different kind of um, sanctuary in, in, in some churches. It's not, some cities around the country do public sanctuary. I, I believe that's very, very dangerous. I think especially in Tucson, that's very, the birthplace of the sanctuary. I, I feel like that's putting a, a target on a church in this political moment. But what we see is we see many churches willing to say that I want to take you, your family, into our family of faith and, and are embracing people and are protecting people. And, and we, see that, uh, we see that in many, many, many different kinds of um, configurations. And so it's interesting that we see the, the secular institutions being very challenging, but we see the faith-based community also very engaged, but not, not feeling uh, a need to, to get into that public kind of fight. So it's a real interesting policy shift, I think. Uh, but the bottom line is a whole lot of folks are being helped and protected. I think we also have to understand uh, the different conditions that we're living in. Uh, the militarization that we all predicted was coming before us that we first experienced is on us. Okay, and so what we have is now a police state, you know, and, and so that, that was different from that time. You know, we could cross people over, we could take people up to Los Angeles, whatever, because um, literally, like, like uh, John was saying, the fence was just a rickety wire line, okay? It's different today. It's different in the courts. It's different in the detention camps. It's different on the line. I mean, when you consider that, uh, the, you know, that the uh, Border Patrol is now up to, what, 20,000 agents, and ICE is, you know, rolling around everywhere. You know, so the pressure, and those even doing political asylum, going into the courts uh, is, is horrific. We are li living in different conditions. Can I add something to that? Those of you who don't know the fence in those days, um, you could go into the, right into Nogada Sonora, downtown, sit in a restaurant called Elvira, and watch just as the sun went down men, women, and children. They would come, come and go, but they would cross the street from the restaurant, go down a tiny uh, gully from here to the bench, and then um, up a little hill, and they're there. For sanctuary, one of the ways of moving people, they would stay at a church in Nogales, at a parish. And then they'd move toward the east hill. 
the cook in one of the parishes helped out on this. On Sunday morning, because of large holes in the cyclone-type fence, they would carry a Bible or a missal, a prayer book, go through there, and you can see Sacred Heart Church on this side, the tower, and walk as if they're going to church. From there, the next day, you know, there'd be the arrangement to move, check out the roads, roadblock, and move from there. But going through that fence, and they would sometimes, Border Patrol would sometimes seal it with new wire. And the next day, <laughs> chop, chop. <laughs> Somebody in Sanctuary, I've really forgotten who it is now, actually, uh, nobody had the, the big clippers like this with the nose on it, you know, and went out and bought a new one. I have a rebuttal to John, um, which is kind of my, my job. Um, but a point of clarification, I think when we, when we look at Sanctuary today, I think the real leadership isn't necessarily coming from colleges and universities, but from communities organizing directly affected communities who are using this idea of expanded sanctuary because, like Lupe said, it's different conditions. And so they're saying to their cities, they're saying to people like Rahm Emanuel, you can't say we're a sanctuary city and then hire all these more police officers that just become part of uh, criminalizing communities of color, which end up being this pipeline, pipeline to detention. So I think we're seeing a lot of leadership from directly affected people who are helping us deepen and expand um, sanctuary. Um, and um, but, but I still think that there is a strong faith role in all of it. Um, there's 50 people um, publicly in sanctuary um, across the nation, um, and they're having successes in their cases and amazingly um, because every case is so diff diff different, and the situation is, um, it is just a different situation, but I still think we're seeing a strong faith. Yes, if I can say so myself. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that um, I have one last question for the panelists, um, unless there's a, there's a burning question out there in the audience, um, because I think it's time that we wrap up a little bit. So my last question is, would any of you like to talk about the work that you're doing now? Um, how it, you know, how you, you built on the roots of the 1980s and, and continue the work? <laughs> well, we'll, we'll, we'll just pass we'll just it down. down. Okay. okay. All right. Well, uh, the work that grew out of the sanctuary movement in the 80s uh, is really the work of Samaritans and no more deaths and humane borders out in the desert. Uh, and the practice of civil initiative, uh, asserting our right uh, to provide humanitarian aid and life-saving aid out there in the desert and document the human rights abuses of the Border Patrol out there in the desert and in the detention systems here, and then lawyers uh, suing them. <laughs> to, to uh, stop the abuses, uh, and I'm talking about physical abuse and verbal abuse and withholding food and water and medical care from, from desperately poor and, and wounded people uh, from the desert. Uh, so, so that work is directly related to, to the sanctuary movement, and, uh, and I think it's the... the really important, one of the really important uh, aspects of, of, uh, of what we learned in the, in the 1980s. And I'm just amazed because I sort of continue to do today what I was doing then and, and um, you know, that's very, very sad. It's very sad. I always thought it would just be, it would be different. Um, but okay, so it's not, so we have to keep doing it. Um, we have a clinic. It's uh, sponsored by No More Deaths and my office, the Pima County Public Defender. And it uh, meets at Pueblo High School every Thursday at 5.30, and it meets in this church the first and third Saturday from 2 to 5. We have Peter, Pat, um, all sorts of people are volunteer. Um, we file asylums for people. We file cancellations for people. We do bond work. We pre and reunite families and get them out of custody as soon as we can. Uh, we have volunteer lawyers in court every day in three cities. Uh, I mean, we're, we're on it, you know, and it's horrific. And we lose every single one, 
and we don't care because all we all we care about is getting them out. Peter cares. He does asylum. He has this. He has like this. He does mushrooms or something. He has this dream, you know, that we're gonna win an asylum case. And you know, we we didn't win them. We didn't win them during the Central American Wars, but then everybody got legalization. So in the end, hey, we won. And it's it's the same deal, you know. Whenever you do this kind of legal stuff in a little box, you have to put it into the context of the political moment. And so I really don't care if we win. What I care about is no families get separated. That's the only thing I care about. Because this will pass. This moment can't be sustained. No. It can't be sustained just like the 80s couldn't be sustained. And when it passes, we want to have as many families together as humanly possible. And that's, that's really what we're doing. And, you know, we need a lot of help. I mean, so and it doesn't matter what you can give, an hour or whatever you can give. Let me tell you, we have a job for you. I've been concentrating for 15 years uh, with health care. But I don't want to take time to go into that because before this group breaks up, there's something else I want to add. Uh, as sanctuary evolves, uh, so many people, starting with Jim Corbett, that were at the heart of it have died. Uh, Rabbi Weizenbaum, for example, Gary McCoy, and the sisters that uh, I, I, won't, I, can't, I could sit here, I think, and shoot out a lot of names. But in my life, because of studies and all, I've been exposed to a lot of, I think, great minds. But honestly, and I've felt this for decades, the greatest mind I've known in my life is Jim Corbett's. That's what I believe. And his writings, you know, we have a presence of things going on, uh, drama, uh, uh, studies, presentations, and all. But that, those writings of Jim, I think his writing is so important urgently that that remains available. To me, he was really the soul of, of the movement. I know somebody else that believes that. <laughs> Thank you, Ricardo. I, I have to tell you, though, there's an expression Quakers have that I would say about what all these folks have had to say. I mean, that, that friend speaks my mind. One of the things that I find so appalling this whole issue all over again, only vastly worse and even more evil than it was before. I find that just heartbreaking. I'm kind of glad Jim isn't here to know it. Um, <coughs> uh, one of the things also out of the sanctuary is like, like to get back to uh, what has emerged from the Monzo experience and that it went through a transformation. And from there, we went to uh, organizing under La Mesilla, organizing project. And after that, uh, Pueblo por La Paz, working with uh, you know the Chiapas uh, uprising, fighting against NAFTA, Derechos Humanos, Alianza Indígenas Sin Fronteras, so that the work, it, it, the political work and act advocacy and uh, ed education of community continues, uh, you know, in face of this horrendous uh, movement from many different directions. And that uh, as, uh, as Jim taught us, you know, at the basis of all of this is hope. You know, that is in, in the love that we have. Uh, there is one final ending of a Jim story. He and I would travel to California often taking refugees and one night he said to me, uh, I'm tired. He said, so we're gonna stop, tell people we're gonna stop for, for a couple of hours. I said, fine. He just drives into the desert. The next thing I see is he walks down and he clears a little path among these cactus and he just falls asleep on the desert floor. That was Jim. That was Jim. I mean, you know, and uh, you know, that's why I never went camping with him. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, let's remember that we have to be hopeful, and 
we have to maintain our passion and we know that we will turn things around. That's a, yeah. I think that's a great note to end on. Um, so thank you very much, HowlRound folks, for tuning in and all of you for coming out. Uh, actors, please come up on stage so we can all take a photo. <laughs>